I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about disinformation and misinformation in the midterm elections, we have with us a very special guest, my colleague at CSIS, Suzanne Spaulding, who is the director of our Defending Democratic Institutions Project and a CSIS senior advisor. Suzanne, of course, is also the former undersecretary at DHS. And just so our listeners know, she has worked on both sides of the political aisle throughout her career, and she is not a partisan. We are a bipartisan institution at CSIS, and Suzanne personifies that. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Andrew. I'm really pleased to be here. So Suzanne, just for our listeners who may not really fully understand what disinformation is. Can you explain what it is and how it differs from misinformation? Yes. So disinformation is the intentional spreading of false or misleading information. So it can all include putting together bits and pieces of things that might be in and of themselves accurate or true, but together create an intentionally misleading perspective. Misinformation is the unintentional spreading of false information. So those are, uh, that's a key distinction. So we're all anxiously waiting the midterm elections, which are coming up in, in just days. And as we know, this is shaping up to be an extremely close election. There's several contentious races around the country in both the Senate and the House, and, and the makeup of the Senate and the House is going to be determined by these races. Almost all of them to my mind, seem to be plagued by disinformation. Are candidates themselves spreading disinformation? And do you think that's helping their campaigns or hurting them? So here I think it is important to make some distinctions. So uh, yes, the short answer is yes. I think candidates are spreading disinformation. But I make a distinction between normal political rhetoric where you might again, present the most extreme version, negative version of your opponent, the most extreme positive view of yourself, and those kinds of things from the kinds of disinformation that really undermines public trust in the legitimacy of our elections, of our democracy, of the the process. Because I think that is where, where we should have real concerns about fundamentally undermining the strength of our democracy. And the sad news is that we do have candidates that are spreading disinformation about the process itself. And so some of the surveys indicate that up to two-thirds of the Republican nominees for state and federal offices have raised concerns and doubts or deny the legitimacy of the 2020 election. And that is very concerning. I mean, for example, a recent article pointed out that if these candidates had been in power in 2020, they would have had the electoral clout to overturn the vote and deny Biden the presidency. That's astonishing. So this really is a problem for our democracy. What are some of the other topics that are causing the most disinformation to be spread in this election? So the, the, again, the ones I am most concerned about go to the processes and the legitimacy of the election themselves. The other thing we're seeing is, and this we, we saw recent reports that China is weighing in with disinformation about the time, place, and manner of voting, putting out disinformation. No absentee ballots are being accepted this year to try to dampen people from sending in their absentee ballots. The disinformation about when, where, and how to vote is some of the most troubling uh, disinformation that we can see because, that again, that goes right to the very core of, of denying people their fundamental right and privilege to vote in election. So it's not just the candidates themselves or groups that are supporting the candidates. It's foreign actors like China. Is Russia also involved in this to any extent that you know of? Oh, very much. I mean, as Christopher Wray, the director of FBI, says, Russian disinformation is a 365-day-a-year operation and concern. When people say they'll be back for the next election, the reality is that they never left. They, they continue on a regular basis to put pernicious messaging into our discourse 
online and through propaganda outlets like RT and Sputnik. And, and they are, as the most recent intelligent alert said, Russia and China are both engaged. They have slightly different objectives that they're really pushing. What the intelligence warning said is Russia is working to amplify doubts about the integrity of U.S. elections. So right to the core of the issues that you and I were just talking about. China is interested in undermining American politicians that it sees as threats to Beijing's interests. So Putin has always, his disinformation has always been about pulling us down to his level. Disproving democracy. Yeah. And to say to his, and, and his most important audience is his domestic audience. But while he's at it, he'll he'll sow chaos and division in, in America to amplify what he's saying. But what he's saying to his people is democracy is just American democracy is just as corrupt and hypocritical and broken as ours mm. and therefore don't long for it. Whereas I think China has traditionally felt that they have an alternative model that they can promote. And they're they have been pushing that traditionally. China increasingly, as we saw from the reports last week, is taking a page from the Kremlin's playbook right. and seeing advantages to simply sowing chaos and division within this country, exacerbating it. Right. And, and Xi Jinping has been talking about the United States engaging in color wars, the same as Putin has been talking about for decades of the United States engaging in color wars, fomenting insurrections in their own countries in Hong Kong, for instance, Ukraine. The Chinese must be a, a bipartisan trafficker of disinformation if they're going after candidates because there's candidates on both sides of the aisle now that are very tough on China. Is that the case? Well, absolutely. And and Russia also. I mean, that's an important thing to, to understand about the these adversary efforts to weaken our democracy. They will come in on both sides of an issue. I've done work over the last several years looking at Russian disinformation that targets our trust in the justice system and exacerbates what is a declining mistrust in our justice system and takes advantages of weaknesses of our own making, so actual flaws and problems in our justice system, but presents a narrative that it is not just flawed but irrevocably broken. But they will weigh in both on the side of racial justice, for example, as they did it when, when Alton Sterling was was tragically shot by law enforcement officers. But then they'll jump in and, and they their, their fake affinity groups tried to stoke the outrage around that. A few days later, when Mika Johnson shot uh, law enforcement officers tragically in Dallas, Texas, uh, partly in response to that, they weigh in with a fake Blue Matters affinity group to try to stoke that. We saw it in the immigration context in Garland, Texas, getting people out on both sides. They're not pushing a particular issue, they are trying to exacerbate divisions and pour fuel on the flames of dissension and, and disunity in this country. Suzanne, how susceptible are Americans to this stuff? I mean, you mentioned at the beginning of our discussion that there's actors, both foreign and domestic, that are trying to delegitimize absentee ballots and voting places and times of when people can vote and th that sort of thing. How susceptible are Americans to this kind of disinformation? We are all susceptible to this kind of disinformation. And uh, partly it is, uh, I believe, that we have created fertile ground for a message that says your system is irrevocably broken and you are powerless to bring about any change. And I think we have, I think that message resonates in different ways with different people. But certainly those who feel that the system have le has left them behind, right, For that's a very, very poignant and powerful message. I think candidates who lose and say that the election was rigged, their followers, that's fertile ground there. But I think part of the reason that we have such fertile ground is we have failed to teach about our democracy and how it's supposed to work and how it works. So it goes back to our classic civics lessons. That's exactly right. I mean, if we, and we haven't been teaching civics all across this country, civics has, has stagnated in so many places where we have stopped teaching it or barely teach it, or the football coach, who may be a wonderful person, is asked to also teach civics. Ever since, frankly, Sputnik, when we realized that STEM was a national security imperative, which it is, the thing that gave way in most in many schools was civics education. So we have not empowered individuals 
with the understanding that the promise of democracy is not its current perfection, which it doesn't have, but its potential for change. The promise of democracy is the possibility of change. But that can only happen if we are the informed and engaged agents of that change, moving us toward that more perfect union. And to be that, you have to understand how the system works and what is your role in it. And if we haven't empowered people with that information, they think their only option is to resort to violence. And China and Russia both know this. Russia has, as part of its military doctrine, talks about tapping into the protest potential of the population. And the stage is set for more political violence. Yeah, you know, this is, brings up exactly what I was about to ask you. In addition to us losing the ability to have civic lessons at our fingertips and from early childhood on throughout our education, it seems to me that we've lost our ability to also be civil as a result of that, right? Yeah, we need to reinvigorate civic skills as well as civic knowledge. And listen, this is a national security imperative, and it's urgent. And we need to make the long-term investment in K through 12, but we've got to reach adults. We got to, we have to reach adults right now. And this is why we've launched Civics at Work, to get civic skills and civic knowledge in the workplace. You know, I, I always think about it as media literacy as well. When we reintroduce adults to civic lessons, how much has disinformation that's more and more prevalent in the media landscape over the past couple of years, how does it impact our ability to do that? Well, it definitely makes it harder, right? One of the things that, that disinformation does so effectively is to move us into that, uh, what my friend Mike Hayden calls that post-truth world, right? It has created doubts among Americans that there is such a thing as an authoritative source of information. We need to be able to look to courts to resolve election disputes to ensure the peaceful transition of power. If you undermine the legitimacy of courts, you frustrate their ability to do that. You make it that much harder for us to have that peaceful transition or retention of power. If you undermine the media, the legitimacy of, of that as a source of information, then again, you have made it that much harder to have an informed Citizenry, And if the citizenry gives up on the idea of being informed, if it gives up on the idea of being able, ever able to discern what is actually true and what is false, they're going to disengage or, they're, as I said, they're going to take to the streets in violence. Part of this, of course, and, and I'm not bringing this up as a partisan of any kind because, as you know, I'm not a partisan either. I've worked for Democrats in Capitol Hill and, and I've also been a producer at Fox News Channel. But what we're dealing with right now, a big topic of disinformation, is that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. And so many Republicans on the ballot this year have continued spreading this false narrative throughout their campaigns. It's being reinforced by Russia and China, as you point out. Some have even implied that they won't accept the results of their own election if they were to lose. We're also seeing this in Brazil right now. Maybe Bolsonaro isn't going to accept the results of the election that was just held this weekend. And who knows what's going to happen in Israel with the election that they're having today. So what does this all say? What can we expect from these candidates if they do, in fact, lose? And what will the response be? Yeah, I, I do think there's the potential, as I've said, for political violence. I, and I think we may indeed see it first at the kind of local level, if it's state house elections. or. But I think it, to the extent that congressional elections are lost by candidates who have been election deniers, who then claim that the, the system was rigged and that their loss was not legitimate, that we could see trouble in Washington again in January when Congress convenes. I think it's really it's up to the American people to decide whether they are going to make this the new normal or not, accept this as the new normal, right? And it starts with the election. It starts with deciding whether you're going to reward or you're going to reject these lies about the election, whether you're going to accept over 60 court cases where judges appointed by presidents of, of both parties asked for evidence to back up these claims of wide-scale fraud and ultimately were forced to reject these claims because there was no evidence presented in court, right? The American people are the only ones who, can really, who really have the power to stop this vicious cycle. We feel so powerless, though, when these kinds of things happen. And even if our courts 
rule correctly as they have. We stood by and watched on January 6th, and those of us who have worked in Washington and worked on Capitol Hill were really, really shocked and saddened by it. And we've seen in state houses around the country already in past campaigns, political violence. What do you think needs to happen at the national level for us to come together and get rid of this from our society? So I I really do think that the American people who are bothered by this need to work hard to hold individuals and institutions accountable, right, when they fail to live up to our aspirations, when they are spreading disinformation. We need to be very adamant that this is not the new normal, that this is not acceptable, right? And so we cannot give in to despair. We have to keep working at this. We have to chip away at the margins. This is not going to be an overnight. This did not happen to us overnight. This was many years in the making, including skepticism about our institutions and declining trust. And there are lots of reasons for that. And the institutions need to live up to our aspirations. We need to hold them accountable. But we need to keep fighting this and chip away. So when I talk about civics, I don't expect that by next year, we're going to have reinvigorated civic knowledge and skills in all Americans, and they're suddenly going to rediscover our shared aspirations, and that we have some things in common, including a sense of national identity. I don't believe that's going to happen overnight, but we have to we have to keep working at it and chip at it bit by bit. It's really interesting you say that because it's not like we can call the fake news plumber and have the fake news plumber come over and turn a few knobs and connect a few pipes and it's done. This is really a long, it's been a long-term problem, as you point out, and it's going to be a forever problem going forward, isn't it? Yep, it absolutely is. Hopefully not forever, certainly not at this scale, right? I do think we have gotten to this point in part, in large part, because we had a president who fanned the flames and who spread disinformation on a massive scale and continues to. So again, my hope is that the elections will send signals, at least in places across the country, that those who spread lies and disinformation will not be rewarded and that bit by bit we'll begin to work our way through finding common ground and insisting that we find ways to be able to ascertain Shared facts. Yeah. Yeah. There's even disinformation about government disinformation right now. Can you explain what that's all about and how we can even wrap our heads around that? Yeah, that is really frustrating to me. Disinformation has to be the work for all of us, right? As individuals, we need to make sure that we make the stigma of spreading false information greater than the prestige of being the first one to share. So individuals need to accept responsibility, the platforms, institutions, et cetera. But government and and in elections, state and local election officials, all of these have a role to play. The federal government also has an important role to play here in disinformation. All of us do. I really am troubled by these allegations, these lies, that the government is trying to be a ministry of truth, that it is using disinformation as a way to surveil and censor a speech. I think it's really important that those who need to work against this pernicious threat are not intimidated from doing this. I think there are voices out there that would love to get the government, the researchers, everyone engaged in disinformation to be chilled from doing their job, to open the lane for disinformation to have free reign without any barriers. And I think we have to resist that at every turn. And that's going to take a lot of courage. And and I want to ask you about this directly because you have experience of being a very senior government official. If you're in a role like you were in and you're trying to right some of these really serious wrongs, is it a scary proposition for you to be in government? Because you don't necessarily have security at 24 hours. And we just saw what happened to Speaker Pelosi's poor husband, who's suffered a, an attack in his home. How scary is it to serve in government at high levels right now and try to combat all this? Yeah, it's it's very scary, and particularly uh, for our, our election folks, not just those in elected office like our secretaries of state, but those who volunteer, those who show up for very little pay but to do their civic duty to work on election day 
all of those involved in, in helping to administer our elections, all of whom feel under threat right now. And that is just a terrible place for us to be. It's very scary. And for those in government who are trying to tackle this issue, look, this is a really complicated, hard issue, even without those kinds of distractions. You want to make sure that you are safeguarding not just the First Amendment, but our broader principles of free speech. You want to make sure that you are maintaining the faith and confidence of the American public, that you're not censoring based on preference or political views. Those are really important measures and steps and things that you need to think about as you're doing this. It's a very complicated area that must be tackled nonetheless. The fact that it's hard doesn't mean we can't do it, and we must do it. But then to add on to that, threats to your personal safety is really awful. It's it's just unspeakable. One thing we haven't talked about yet that I want to close with is we haven't yet talked about social media and its role in spreading disinformation and we all know now that Elon Musk has acquired Twitter, which is worrying a lot of people that disinformation on the platform may rise. What's your take on that? So I'm worried about that. I'm on Twitter, and I've already, I will say, in the last few days, seen some odd followers pop up on my list. And I've lost a lot of followers, which I take as people voting with their feet. And I, and I think, and on that point, I think it's really important that, that we give individuals greater choice so that if Elon Musk takes Twitter into a place where it becomes another gutter platform that is filled with lies and hate speech, toxic online environment, that people have choices, that they have places to go. The, right now, it's very hard for new platforms to emerge and to make it because you want to be on a platform where all your friends and family are, right? You want to be able to share. So there's legislation on the Hill that's looking to address this. Lots of smart people are thinking about this. Folks need to think about how important competition is to be able to enable us to vote with our feet. I, I want to be careful having mentioned legislation. We don't endorse any particular legislation. But Congress does need to look at this, and there need to be ways for us to say, okay, we're going to go to this platform that has a better environment and does a better job uh, taking care of false lies and the toxic environment. Because we're really talking about, when we talk about these social media platforms, not just Twitter, but others, it's critical infrastructure at this point, isn't it? I would say in some circumstances, it, it would should be considered critical infrastructure. That's, for a lot of people, that's a very loaded term. But I think it's the fundamental definition of critical infrastructure, as former undersecretary at DHS, is Systems, networks, and assets, the disruption or corruption or degradation of which would have damaging effect on national security, economic security, or public health and safety, or any combination thereof. It was not hard to determine that elections, election sure. infrastructure, fit that definition. And certainly what happens on social media can have a very direct impact on our national security. I can tell you right now, Suzanne, that if Twitter, which is a platform that CSIS uses very often, like daily, we're tweeting all day long about our work and what our events and things like that. If Twitter becomes a place where disinformation is allowed to thrive, we're going to have to take a very serious look as a center as to whether we, CSIS, want to be part of that platform. I, I just think we'll have to have a, a discussion with our leadership and our colleagues about it, and it worries me. I think that's exactly right. So, I'm in a kind of wait-and-see mode. Yeah. Well, worried, but we'll see. I'm worried, too, and I hope that this election goes a lot smoother than we think it's going to go. And thank you so much, Suzanne, for your time today. It's a fascinating discussion. Andrew, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, the Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 